All right, hey everyone. Um, I'm Sean Ellis, as Katrina was saying. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, so today is, uh, or this week is actually a pretty exciting week. Um, uh, Katrina mentioned that I spent time at Dropbox as the first marketer there. This is the week where Dropbox is supposed to do their IPO. So it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting having watched them over the years uh, after I left. And um, especially recently, people have been asking, as, as the news has picked up around it, uh, how they became the fastest SaaS company to reach the $1 billion revenue run rate. And uh, I had the opportunity to interview their uh, current head of marketing uh, about three or four weeks ago at the Growth Hackers Conference. And what she said was that uh, what makes Dropbox unique is that the entire company takes ownership of growth. And so I, th I think that's that's pretty interesting when you think about it. To me, that, that is actually what's key to breakout growth really in any company today. So if you, if you think about the fastest growing companies like Facebook, Spotify locally, um, and, and Airbnb, Uber, all of these really fast growing companies, everyone across the business takes ownership of growth. And that's, that's really what it takes to be successful today, I believe. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is how, how you can have a company where everyone takes that ownership and you can really build that, that culture of growth across your business and five steps really to getting there. So let's start by looking at Dropbox because that's where I had the, the first hand experience of being able to, to watch a company from uh, when I joined, I joined the week that the company uh, publicly launched its product and uh, worked with the CEO, one of the, the first things that we agreed on. So there was only engineers when I, when I joined the company. They hadn't done any testing yet up to that point. And one of the things we agreed on was that we wanted to create this culture of growth and experimentation in the business. And so what we initially had to do, you can't create a culture of experimentation until you run your first experiment. So the big thing was trying to figure out what that first experiment was going to be. And so I did a lot of research when I first got in there, measured everything, tried to understand what was happening. And then uh, we, we ran surveys really every day for about the first two months and really got an understanding of what was happening, came up with some ideas for experiments. Of course, if I went to the engineers and said, please implement this experiment. They probably would have uh, told me that they were too busy, but um, I worked through the CEO to get those first few experiments live. But when they saw, wow, look what happened to growth when we, when we ran an experiment and, and it worked, and then we run another one and it works. And not everything worked, but enough worked where they got the idea that this, this experimentation thing is, is really in their comfort zone. It's, it's math. And if you try enough things, you're going to figure out better and better ways to grow the business. And so what was really cool is when I left Dropbox, it was, it was an interim VP marketing role. So when I left Dropbox after six months, it was another nine months before the next marketer or growth person joined the company. Company, and the engineering team alone came up with their own experiments, ran their own experiments, continued to run that experimentation, and they actually published their numbers um, last year around this time of what their revenue numbers were all the way through their, their history to that billion dollar revenue run rate. And you can see that they didn't miss a beat when they didn't have a marketer or a growth person on the team. And so I think there's really a model there that we can all learn from. And it starts with the understanding that Everyone in the company plays a role in growth, whether they, whether they know it or not, they're, they're playing a role in growth, especially people in roles such as sales and marketing, of course, but product plays a big role, customer support plays a big role. Basically, that customer journey goes through a lot of different groups and departments, and so it's not just the marketing team that's focused on driving growth, it's, it's really everyone plays a role and the goal is to actually get people to understand the role they're playing and improve the role they're playing and, and just be more coordinated around it. And when that happens, that's pretty powerful. So basically, no company that is, uh, no, no growth team or marketing team can outperform a company where, where everyone in the business is mobilized to, to drive growth in the business. So of course, a growth team or a marketing team is better than an individual just one marketer or one growth person, but when, when the whole company is doing that, that's, that's where there's a lot of power. And so the five steps that I'm gonna take you through today that help, uh, will help you get to that point are, are here documented. So the first is 
I'm gonna go through each of these in, in detail in a second, but the first is you need to have the right product in the right market. That, that still is, is the biggest determinant of, of long-term growth of a business. If, if people don't consider the product a must have, you're gonna have a hard time growing that business. But once you have the right product in the right market, then it's important to actually uh, define what your success metric is. So how, how are you gonna actually measure growth and then uh, instrument for growth? So how, how are you gonna measure all of the things that matter for growth and how are you going to be able to run tests? So, so putting the, the parts in place to where you can actually manage growth. The next step is where you start to actually have a growth team, ideally, but so essentially a team that's tasked with executing a growth process to find new and better ways to accelerate growth in the business. And so long term, you want to have everybody doing it, but early on, you need to dial it in with, with an individual team. After that, you want to be able to have that team focus their energies where, where it really matters to accelerate growth the most, so that the super high impact areas. And then finally, you want to bring everyone in the business to work together to drive growth. But that's, that's down the line. You don't start right out of the gate there. So the, the first most important thing, most important thing for Dropbox for sure, beyond anything else that we did, it was a fantastic product. It is a fantastic product. And so you need to be a must-have product for enough people that they keep coming back and using the product. And if you have that, you can drive sustainable growth. If, if they don't keep coming back and using the product, you really can't grow over time. What you can do is just replace people over time. So for validating product market fit, there's really two ways to do it. Most people, when they talk about product market fit, are talking about the lagging indicator of product market fit, and, and that's about measuring retention cohorts. So if I have 100 people who start using my product, two months later, how many people are still using it? If, if there's 50 people, that's pretty good. And then five months after that, maybe you're down to 20 people. But it takes a long time to figure out if you have product market fit, if you have to keep waiting and to see when, when eventually it flattens out and, and people keep staying on your product. So what I came up with uh, as, a, as a faster way to get a read on product market fit is uh, just asking people on a product, how would you feel if you could no longer use this product? And so if you ask them that question and they say, I would be very disappointed if, if they had to stop using the product, then, then there's a good chance they're going to keep using it over time and you can get that read kind of right away. And what I found is companies that had at least 40% of their customers saying that they'd be very disappointed without the product, usually I could grow those companies pretty well. If it was less than that, the, they were a lot harder to grow. But ultimately, the big message here is that you need the right product in the right market. It needs to be a must have. And then you can support growth. Once you can support growth, then it's important to be able to, to instrument growth. So that takes us to the, to the second level, which is really preparing to grow and defining what is the metric that we're going to try to grow, how do we improve growth over time. So instrumentation becomes the next really big thing. And so for Dropbox, we definitely spent a lot of time setting up the tracking, understanding where people were coming from, what they did the first day, what they did 10 days later, how they eventually got to understand the full product. If you don't have that tracking in place, it's really hard to actually drive improvement. So the first set of tools that you need are the tools to understand what's going on. And so even though they hadn't done any testing before I got there, I still could see that Dropbox was pretty special. It was, it was coming out of the gate very fast as a, as a fast growing company. And so the, the first thing I wanted to make sure I didn't do was, was mess that up. And so I was really careful not to break things. And, and if you don't understand what's going on, there's a good chance you'll break it. So that's why I ran the surveys every day. That's why I measured everything. Once we understood, then we could focus on improvement. So that the next set of tools are the tools to improve. So that's where you want like A-B testing tools for being able, to, uh, being able to test pages on the site, being able to test email. And then sometimes for the in-product tests, you might need your engineering team and some, some kind of in-house built tools. But basically, being able to have tools to understand, tools to improve, and then something that brings that information together so that your uh, team actually understands it, how to drive growth over time and get smarter about driving growth. That's the instrumentation part. And then the next part is being able to actually measure growth. And 
This concept can be a little bit confusing, but there's an idea of North Star metric in growth that is really important. Um, Facebook's the first company that I really heard talk about it, and I, th I think they're probably the greatest growth company out there. And so North Star metric is, is essentially a metric that's not just like signups for my product or downloads for my app, but is, is more focused around value that people are getting. So what you're trying to figure out is the footprint of value over time that people are getting from your product. So you can add more value by getting them to use the product twice as much. You can add more value by getting twice as many people on your product. But it's, it's less about kind of a vanity metric like registrations or downloads and more about trying to capture that footprint of value. So this is kind of a confusing concept. I'll give you an example in a minute on this. But um, if you want to research more on this, just search what is a North Star metric in Google. And you'll get some more information around that. And that's this, I think, is one of the most fundamental parts of growth. And it's not the only metric that matters. It is the most important metric, but there's a lot of submetrics to that. So I've already touched on you could you could double your North Star metric by increasing the number of people that you're that you're bringing to your site. That that might be able to to double it or getting twice as many or tw uh, twice as high a percentage of people who come to your site to actually use your product the first time, or better retaining people, or better uh, driving referrals off your people. There's, there's a lot of things that you can do to move your North Star metric that's not just about spending more money. It's about adding efficiency and, and driving referrals and, uh, and even revenue tests. So there's a lot of different sub-metrics that you can work to improve your North Star metrics. So to understand all of this, Facebook's a good example because probably everybody's familiar with Facebook. And um, so Facebook, the North Star metric for Facebook is, uh, is just daily active users. And if you think about the value that you get from Facebook, it's really when you go to Facebook and you see updates from your friends, you get some value. So you can imagine when somebody first signs up for Facebook and hasn't connected with anybody, they don't have any value yet, really. So maybe they, they set up their own profile, but no one can even see it because they haven't connected with anyone. So the first time you see some value is when you make that first connection. And then you can go in and, and see what someone's history of updates are. But if you came back the next day, you probably wouldn't see any changes. And so what the uh, data analysts at Facebook figured out is that it's not until you have about seven friends on Facebook that you actually start to get value from the system where you could come back on a, on a daily basis and actually see new updates in your feed. And if it takes you a year to get those seven friends, you're probably going to give up on Facebook. So you have only so much time to get someone to that point before they give up. So what they figured out is it's about 10 days. If you don't get someone to seven friends in 10 days, they're going to stop using it. So the only thing that matters for the Facebook growth team in the beginning is get someone to seven people connected in 10 days, and there's a good chance that you'll be able to retain them. So showing them ads during those uh, first days is not nearly as important as showing them people that they might know so they can increase those connections. So that's how you start to use this North Star metric. So you're trying to grow these daily active users, and you're trying to understand what are the submetrics that, that move that North Star metric. So once you have all of that, we haven't even started growing yet. This is just preparing for growth. Once you have all of that, then you can focus on actually starting to accelerate growth. And this is where a growth team does matter a lot. And the whole idea of this growth team is to increase the learning velocity of how can you drive growth in the business. And so um, what, what you're doing here, probably the, the, you don't really learn anything until you try something different. And it's through trying things different that you start to figure out which works better. And so uh, Twitter is a great example here. Twitter, um, in 2010, they started to flatten out their growth. And a new VP of product came in and said, how many tests are we running? I mean, they had a lot. Of, they still had 50 million people, even though they were flattening out growth. So they had a lot of people to be able to test against. And he found that they were only running a couple of tests a month. And he said, that's not nearly enough learning. We're not going to be able to improve growth until we can run a lot more tests. So he set a goal of 10 tests per week. And as soon as they started running the 10 tests per week, you can see that growth recover. It's because with every test comes learning. Even if it's not successful, you still learn something and you still get smarter. And so that's really what the growth team is doing, is just trying to figure out what are better ways to improve everything in the business. 
And so that's where you have a team that is really executing a process, and that team might start with an individual growth person if you're a small company. If you're a large company, then sometimes you can carve out and, and develop a new growth team that, that's a function that, that drops in there, but still, you have to start somewhere, and so the, the starting point is usually someone, one person who's executing it, and then over time that person is more about trying to coordinate other resources, and their, their big goal is just to increase that testing throughput, and so that's where they would add an analyst, uh, designers, developers, anything that, that can actually increase that testing throughput uh, is an important person to add to that team. And then they're following a process. If you're running 10 tests per week, you can imagine that there's a lot of information. That would get pretty crazy pretty fast. So you want to be super systematic about that process. And so the process that they use is, is really similar to the scientific process that's been around forever. And it's basically analyze the situation, find new opportunities to improve growth, and then generate ideas for tests that you would run, and then have a system for prioritizing those ideas to decide which tests you're going to run, run the tests, analyze the results, get smarter about new ideas, and just keep repeating that, and as you repeat that, you get smarter about increasing growth in the business. So for a growth team, probably the most important thing that they do every week is a growth meeting that's really designed to help them drive that learning velocity. And so this is the, the agenda that I recommend in that meeting. And it starts with looking at the output. So you're looking at what is, how is our North Star metric trending? Is it, is it going down or is it, is it going up? If it's going up, why do we think it's going up? It, if, if we have some sub-metrics that we're working on, so like activation, if we're working on that, how's that metric trending? And so you're kind of figuring out from a high level what's happening, and then you go into the specific tests. So your analyst will take you through tests that they've actually analyzed in the last week. You're processing that learning as a group. Then you're looking at the machine for testing. So if we planned to launch three tests last week and we only launched one, what happened to the other two? Oh, we couldn't get a designer. Then you probably don't want to uh, run new tests the next week that require a lot of design work. So you want to work around resource constraints, but you also want to think about how do we add more design resources so we can run tests that, that would require a designer. So once you've done all of that, then you think about the next week's test to run. We recommend a process where everyone on the growth team brings a couple of ideas to the meeting that they want to have uh, run that week. They pitch them in a 30-second little pitch, and then as a group, you decide the you know, what, what I recommend for most companies is two or three tests per week to start with, and then over time to try to crank that up. Obviously, if you're a B2B, really expensive product, you might only be able to run a couple of tests per month. But whatever it is, understand how many tests you're running and, and try to increase your learning velocity because that's how you get smarter about accelerating growth. So once you've done that, then you start to realize that this growth process is really easy to run in some areas. So if you're a marketing team, it's really easy to run a bunch of Facebook tests, Facebook ad tests, but the minute that you want to try a new installer for your software product, you're probably going to run into to, to big problems. And so you want to, over time, though, be able to test anywhere across that customer journey. And, and so once you get that habit of testing going, then you want to try to start to focus that machine of testing into the areas where you can really make a difference. And what you'll find is that a lot of times when you actually try to run a test, you run into somebody saying, no, you can't test here. Stay out of, stay out of this area. And so I'm going to give you a, a quick example from Log Me In where we saw that and we were able to uh, work around that. So when I joined Log Me In, it was in the early days. This was right before Dropbox. And uh, we, we originally were trying to grow the business, and I, as a marketer, kind of my safe zone was, was marketing and spending money, so I could spend about $10,000 a month on marketing, but I had a CEO who was telling me, spend 100000 But I knew every time I spent 11000 or 12000 I started losing money. And so kind of all the tests that we were running, we couldn't break out of that $10,000 per month. But when we stepped back, we saw that 90% of the people, over 90% of the people who signed up never actually used the product. And so we were one of the first freemium businesses out there. So usage was really important to the model. And so I knew I was going to never be able to scale cost effectively that marketing spend until we could get people who signed up to actually use the product. And so to our CEO's credit, he said, 
All right, engineering team, product team, marketing team, let's, let's all get together. And he said, marketing team, you're not doing any new campaigns. You, we'll keep the ones that are working going, but for the next few months, no more ad testing. You're gonna focus on this problem. Product team, engineering team, no more product roadmap. Anything you were planning to do, we're gonna drop all of that for the short term and just focus on increasing the sign up to usage rate on the product. And so when we all came together and focused on that, within four months, we were able to get a thousand percent increase in the sign up to usage rate. And that's suddenly, instead of being able to spend $100,000 a month, I could now spend a million dollars a month with a three month payback on dollars invested. So by all coming together on that problem, we were able to really, that's when the business did the breakout growth. Today it's about a six and a half billion dollar company. And I think if we hadn't all come together and focused on that, we, we would have had a really hard time growing the business to, to where it originally got to, or eventually got to. So really what you wanna do is take a step back. Once you've got that growth process going, you've got some wins, you wanna share those wins with the team and basically get your department heads, your CEO, and everyone together and say, it's time for us to take growth to the next level. Let's start applying this growth process where it can really matter to drive growth in the business. And so for a lot of companies, I'll, I'll go in and do a full day with the company. So it's not something that it's a 15 minute meeting and you're done. It's, it's, there's a lot of education and, and decisions, but there's so much power. Just remember at, at Log Me In, we spent four months all coming together and working on this. So, but it's the difference between a company that's worth billions of dollars and a company that probably wouldn't even be around today. So this is a really important meeting to drive alignment and what you think can happen if you actually can run tests in those areas, really try to contextualize what problems, you know, if you can get user videos of somebody trying to use the product and sign up and use it for the first time and they're having issues, that can really help to, to create a problem that people wanna solve as a team and then, you want to actually set some objectives around, okay, we have this many people that are activating on the product, we want it to get it to this, or our retention rate is only this, we want to get it to this, but setting a clear objective and then communicating progress against that objective to your CEO, to your department heads, and being able to show these are the ideas that we have, these are the tests that we're running, and this is the result that we're driving. And by having that transparency around progress, now you can start to engage the other executives and the CEO in the growth process where they can see how this impacts growth. So now you're running tests, you've got this machine going, you're in the really high value areas, and now's the time where you wanna actually become this growth culture company that's the big breakout growth businesses like, like the Facebooks and the Spotify's and, and the Dropboxes. And that's, this part's hard. The culture is something that takes time to change. In an early stage company, like with Dropbox, we could do it in just, literally it took a couple of months before people bought into it. For you know, a Microsoft or a you know, big, big company, uh, Walmart, it, it might take years to, to make that change, but I think the change is, is an important one to where you start to have everyone realizing that everything in the business, there's a better way to do everything. And um, you see it in earlier stage companies like Tesla. Uh, if, if you say in Tesla that that's how we've always done it, you can actually get fired for that. That's, that's a fireable offense because they, they want that mindset of everything we're doing, there's a better way to do that. And, and that's ultimately what you're trying to get to with, with a company. And so it's interesting that, I, again, I mentioned that Facebook, I think, is the best in the world at this. And for a long time, I recognized, the first time I heard about North Star Metric, I heard about it from Facebook. The first time I heard about a growth team, I heard about it from Facebook. But it took me only until, uh, only about uh, four weeks ago, I read an article where I realized the third piece of what was really important to Facebook's growth, and it was bringing mission into the conversation, and, and mission is ultimately what helps engage the broader team around growth, and so uh, this mission of bring the world closer together is something that Mark Zuckerberg, in this article I was reading it, they said Mark Zuckerberg finds a way to get that into every conversation that he's having. He's mind-numbingly efficient about getting it into every conversation that he has inside the company and outside the company. And then your North Star metric then becomes how you quantify progress against that mission. And so North Star metric is really important for driving alignment. So my, my co-author on my book works at Facebook and he said at Facebook everybody 
can, can query from their desk, what is our North Star metric right now? What's the trend? Where has it been? Like that's really important, but a metric by itself is not that powerful. A metric that has context around impact against the mission is much better for rallying everybody. So that's, that's where ultimately it's important to connect it to the mission. And as you then start to create objectives, high leverage objectives, rather than just working as a growth team to try to come up with ideas to improve that, share those out more broadly across the company to get everyone in the company trying to generate ideas against that objective and problem solving. So again, like that log me in example, so much came when we all came together as a group and, and worked on, on the most broken part of our growth engine. That's, that's where we got that big breakout growth. So inviting people in, inviting problem solvers in, customer support people have so many good insights, for example. Engineers are natural problem solvers. They're going to come up with some good ideas. And so the more that you can engage the broader team to solve the big issues, the more that you can really come up with ideas that, that can be big for, for breakout growth. And then just as importantly, when you actually get a win, share that more broadly with the team. That was, that was critical at Dropbox of getting these engineers bought into the process. When we shared the wins, they got excited. They wanted to participate in growth. So that's in, in the big picture. There's a lot in between there, but in the big picture, that's what you're trying to do to get to this point where you have breakout growth in the business. You don't just get there overnight where you have this growth culture across the company. First, dial in the process, get, get your growth team. Before you complicate it where you're, where you're bringing in other department heads and, and you're trying to get everyone coming up with ideas, just get a, a small growth team that's holding itself accountable for how many tests are we running each week. Every test is learning. Let's get that habit dialed in. Then let's bring in the other executives to try to focus that testing machine to where it can really make impact. And then finally, let's try to drive this mindset across the full business where everyone now is looking for opportunities to drive improvement in the business. And when you can mo mobilize the full company to generate growth and to, to come up with ideas for improvement in all areas, that's where you get really the magic of, uh, that, of the breakout growth that you see at Dropbox and Facebook and probably Spotify as well. So I, I spent a lot of time with the Spotify team, but I'm... I don't want to speak too much on it because there's probably someone here from Spotify who will correct me if I say too much. So, <laughs> um, so that's it. Hopefully this will be helpful for you in, in driving breakout growth at your business. Um, we may have some time for questions. I don't know if you want to do that or not. Yeah? Thanks. Should we do questions? Or? Yes, yeah? a couple Good. of minutes for questions. Um, thank you so much. Do you think like I was Wondering when I listen, do you think like growth hacking has become a magical world? You know, word, <laughs> word that people use for, well, I think our company is doing growth hacking. Yeah, I think know? it's very misunderstood that for yeah. some people it's, it's about like magic tricks that drive growth. Exactly. Um, for me, when I coined the term, the blog post that I wrote coining the term, really talked about it as a process, a, a process yeah. of testing where you're, where you're just, it's that relentless testing where you're trying to drive improvement, and it's not one magic thing that you know is going to work, it's trying lots of things to, that, that ultimately drive breakout growth, and I think the biggest mindset change, because that, that's always happened in marketing, yeah. that you run lots of tests, but doing that across the full customer journey mm -hmm. so that all customer touch points you're running that testing is where I think you get the really big bang for your work on that. Yeah. Let's check with the editorial department. Do we have any questions? We do not have a microphone, so just a second. Um, and what you said about bringing the whole company, like that's really workable for a lot of projects, isn't it? It's not only growth, it's you know, having touch points from the whole company. Yeah, and I think, I think what you find is that most companies get very comfortable in their silos. Yeah. Marketers do marketing stuff, salespeople do sales exactly. stuff, product people do just core product. But one, one of the big uh, data points that I think surprises a lot of people is the fastest growing companies are generally spending about 50% of their product development resources on the first customer experience. Yeah. So if you That's don't have a good first customer mm -hmm. experience, there is no second customer experience. Mm -hmm. and you so, get no second chance. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so really most of your growth comes from really nailing that first customer experience. And so that's, that's a big mindset change for most product people mm -hmm. who are thinking, let's, let's be really customer friendly, get all the feedback from our mm -hmm. existing customers and keep making the product better. 
and, and it's usually at the expense of making it accessible and easy to use and, and speed to value for the first time user. Yeah. So do we have a question? Yes. Uh, do you have an example uh, of a test you did at Dropbox and uh, what you learned from it? An example you did at Dropbox, a test you did at Dropbox and what you learned. That's yeah, a big question. Well, some, uh, some of I have NDAs under some stuff that I'm not <laughs> sure that. Uh, Please that, tell that, us. Still, but I, I'll give you an example from Log Me In that I think um, that uh, if I have an NDA there, it's probably expired by now. Um, okay. So we had. Let's say so. <laughs> so we had um, one channel that we had turned on that sent 200,000 new people a day to the website. And uh, there was a 10% sign-up rate to, to actually uh, registering for the product. So that was really good. This was after everything that we had done before. Um, and so 10% sign-up rate, 20,000 new people a day. And these, we were paying two cents to get them to the website. So it was a really good channel for us. And then again, like before, over 90% of the people dropped off. Mm -hmm. And so we just randomly were doing a bunch of tests. Like they, they, they weren't downloading the software. So we made the download button bigger. Brighter, they, they still weren't downloading it. You run out of screen space eventually. And then we got the bright idea to finally just ask them, yeah. why are you signing up and not downloading the software? And the answer we got back was, I don't believe it's free. Oh. And so our next test, we actually gave them two download choices. Download the free version or download a trial of the paid version. And we put a big check mark in the free version, and we got a 300% increase in the download rate. Interesting. So what, like, once you can contextualize the problem yeah. you're solving, and it, it got out of our head, we were thinking the problem was people signing up and not downloading. That's our problem. That's not their problem. Mm -hmm. When we reframed it to their problem, I don't believe it's free, then the solution we came up with really made a difference in improving yeah. conversions. So asking the customers is a yeah. very good Qualitative device. is huge. Yeah. Uh, Sean, I know you are going to, to be out in our WebDog and our corner to have, if people have more questions to you yep. during lunch break. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.